is running out. It's you, boy. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, welcome to Here for Fear. Uh, this is Rick, and this is the podcast that talks about scary movies or movies trying to be scary. Today, uh, we are uh, we have a brand new guest here. Uh, my coworker Jake Poindexter, Poindexter, and the lead singer of Lesser Sons. Good afternoon. Hey, man, thanks for coming on out. Hey, pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man, we wanted to get you on last year, and of course, you know, we've been dealing with this uh, virus, um, you know, but uh, I'm glad you could finally roll on out, and and you and I could talk. Uh, 1987's Hellraiser. Hellraiser. Yes, I'm excited to be here. Yeah. Great cool, film. Before you and I jump into it, I'll we'll do a quick synopsis. Uh, a woman discovers the newly resurrected and partially formed body of her brother-in-law. She starts killing for him to revitalize his body so he can escape the demonic beings that are pursuing him after he escaped their sadistic underworld. We are eternity to know. All right, man. So 1987's Hellraiser, written and directed by Clive Barker. Clive uh, Barker. You, yeah, you recommended this one. Yeah, uh, I'm a huge Clive Barker fan. Yeah, you read some. You read a lot of his books, right? Or some of his books? Not all of his books, but I've read. Uh, you know, I've read The Hellbound Heart, which this movie is is based on. Um, I've read Imagica. I've read The Great and Secret Show and Everville. I'm still waiting on the third book of the art that's supposed to come out at some point. Um, but The Thief of Always, a sort of children's book that he put out. Um, just a, a big fan of his work, although there is yeah. plenty of his work that I haven't I haven't read. So. Yeah, so I'm not a, I think I told you this, I'm not a reader. Um, I'd rather just pop in a movie and get it out in 90 minutes to two hours. Um, I try to read Weave World back mm -hmm. in the day and I just got lost. I can't I, remember if I've read dude, that one I, or not. I tried it and, and that, that one was enormous. It looked like, I, I, I don't know, man, that thing looked like it's six, eight inches, t you know, uh, thick. It's a brick. And I just, I tried, I tried, I wanted to at least give it a shot and I just, I couldn't do it. So I stopped it. I don't even remember if it was halfway, a quarter of the, who knows, you know, now I have not read the Hellbound Heart. I know Hellraiser is based off of that. Would you say it's like, um, do they, do they use a, you know, Clyde Barker, of course, wrote, wrote the book and he wrote the screenplay and directed this. Did he, did he kind of get off, you know, maybe a little bit like, did he just, did he follow the book or did he, did he take some liberties and change some stuff? Because again, it's Hollywood or whatever it is, you know, there are definitely some changes, but nothing too major. I think he stayed pretty loyal to the source material, which I, I think is a thing when a, when a writer is directing his own work, he tends to, uh, stay guard that source material a little bit more. Um, there are a couple of small, um, scene changes that take place, but for the most part, um, I, I think it really did stick to the source stick material to it. very yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's see, that's good. I, I mean, you know, I know, I know, I know with when when directors, you know, like a writer, for instance, you know, hey, I wrote this book, like a Stephen King, for instance, you know, it's like, hey, I want to direct this, you know, but you know, then they sometimes they get they get their arms twisted or or you know, some, some big wigs and in, in Hollywood say, well, you know, I want you to change this mm -hmm. or add this or do this, and I and I get it, I get it for the sake of the movie, but. You know, if you're if you if you wrote this book, I mean, it's near and dear to your heart, right? It's like I don't want to change these things. It's like yeah. it's like Stephen King with The Shining. He hated Kubrick's version yeah, of it. That's what hated I mean. it. And I never read The Shining, so I, I I don't know. I can't I can't you know compare the two. I love the movie, you know, but but he loathes it. I just it's crazy, you know. Is it oh, yeah. because he he you know he he got so far away from the 
you know, Kubrick did from the actual story and and used those liberties and it really like pissed Stephen King off. I don't know. I don't know. I've heard that about The Shining. I haven't read The Shining and God, it's probably been a pile of years since I've seen The Shining. Yeah. Um, but I did hear that about Stephen King completely loathing it. Yeah. Um, which it, it's funny that you bring that up because uh, there is a movie that I just watched with my kid last week. Um, Ready Player One. Oh yeah, and that's great. So a big part of that uh, movie, a big part of the plot is that they talk about The Shining and there's the whole scene where they go through the Outlook Hotel. Very interesting thing that plugs into what we're doing now is that I was looking at a character in that movie and it's the old lady that lives at the bottom of the stacks. You know in the movie the, the yes. kid comes down the stacks mm-hmm. and there's the old lady who's planting flowers at yeah. the bottom of it. Claire Higgins. It's, oh, really? Yeah, it's Julia from Hellraiser. And I was no looking shit. at her, I'm like, where do I know that woman's face from? She's got a face. It's something creepy. I know her from somewhere. I looked it up, and it's Claire really? Higgins. Yeah, it's Claire Higgins from Hellraiser. Oh, my God. I, I, I watched Ready Player One. Not that long. Well, actually, I popped it in, and I didn't. I don't think I started from the, to be, from the beginning, and I kind of jumped around a little bit. But it's a fantastic movie. I was just talking to my neighbor about it last night. Because of all the references, especially all the 80s stuff. Of course. The fact that they recreated that, that Overlook Hotel, dude, that was phenomenal. Yeah. Like, I was blown away. I could not believe, like, oh, it's going to look okay. No, it was, like, dead on. <laughs> it, and, yeah, when you're, the parts that you're looking at that you actually think in that particular film are um, just taken directly from the film, you're like, no, that was complete CGI recreation of the film, and it looks dude, it's nuts. You know, photorealistic. The fact that they can do that stuff these days, it just blows me away, you know? But anyways, before you and I jump into Hellraiser, we'll talk about this. Uh, it, it had been a while since I'd seen it, um, but I'd seen it several times over the years. In fact, I saw it when it came out in the theater and, and was lucky enough to meet Clive Barker uh, back in the... God, I want to say it was like the late 80s, yeah. early 90s at so Tower, jealous. Tower Books. Nice. The Tower, remember Tower Books? Yeah. We don't got Tower Records. Well, is there still a Tower Records or books somewhere else other than here in California? I'm Not wondering. in California. The last Tower Records that I heard, that I have heard of was, and it was when I watched the documentary on Tower Records oh. that Tom Hanks' son put out. Oh, okay. Um, a couple years ago. Uh, the last one was in Japan somewhere. Oh, my God. So, that's such a bummer. Like we have nothing anymore, man. Dimples yeah. all gone. I, there's like nothing. We can't go anywhere. I used to love just, you know, going to a place and just walking up and down the aisles, yeah. whether I was going to buy something or not, yeah. you know, picking up stuff, putting it back and just the idea that we could go somewhere. And now it's just, it's all gone. It sucks, man. Yeah. You know, it's like people say, you know, it's not about the destination. It's about the journey. Well, perusing the aisles at a blockbuster or at a record store was the journey to getting you to that piece of art or media that you want to watch. And, and I, totally. I miss it. I, I do. Miss, miss it. I do. I miss it, man. Well, so what we do is when we have a new guest on and you're, this is the first time uh, you've been on. I, we, uh, I come up with some questions and I just ask you some questions. Uh, I have not shown you these, so you don't know what these are. Uh, they're horror related. Fair game. Um, that way, you know, the audience can kind of get uh, an idea of maybe who you are, you know, get a better understanding of maybe, you know, um, how much you like horror and, you know, st- kind of stuff, stuff like that, you know. Um, and so um, I got six questions. I'm just going to throw okay. them out and just, yeah, just answer them honestly. If you can't think of anything, come back to one. It's not a big deal. Shoot. Um, you, you know, I'm not you're not you're not uh, getting judged on them you're not going to win a prize uh anything like that understood you know? understood yeah. so so first question if a zombie apocalypse broke out what would be your weapon of choice machete machete nice and a 22 right. caliber rifle <laughs> yeah All right. something you can throw over your shoulder throw a backpack full of ammo machete on one side yeah they've got a little uh uh Oh, I can't remember the name of the rifle anymore. I really should know this rifle, but I've got one at home. It's a little fold up stock oh, rifle. Okay. Nice. That was quick, man. You, it seems like you've thought about this. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's say on, on the same, uh, you know, uh, subject of that, let's say you get bit, I don't know, on the arm. Would you cut off the arm in order to stop the spread of the virus or are you, you killing yourself or someone else killing you? I would like to think that I'm the type of person with the constitution enough to cut his own arm off, but I fucking <laughs> serious. I'm sorry. I, I no, seriously doubt I, want, yeah. I doubt I'd be able to actually do it. Um, if I'm being honest with myself, I would be the, all right, I got to leave you now. I yes. don't want anyone to kill me. 
<laughs> like John Leguizamo says in Land of the Dead, I want to find out what the other side's like. Yeah. So yeah. probably go wander off by myself and let nature take its course. Yeah. Quote unquote. I think I, I think I would be on the same. Yeah. I, I I don't know if I could do that, man. And I don't know if I could have someone else just chop my arm off or something. Whatever, whatever, you know, limit is that like, yeah. say I got bit in the leg or the foot. I'm like, oh, I don't think that's happening, man. I just don't think I could do that. Yeah. If there was a Brad Pitt around that was going to whack my arm off, uh, then yeah, I'll take it. Sure. I'd appreciate it later, but I don't know anybody that's, <laughs> that's going to be able to cut my arm off for me. Yeah. 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 Uh, let's see. Uh, question number two, if you're, if you were in an 80 slasher, how long do you think you would last and why? Uh, I would probably be, I wouldn't last that long. Um, because I'm kind of the smart ass everywhere I tend to go, the smart ass never really lasts all that long. No, no. He's the, you know, the, the, he's not the romantic lead. He's not the strong alpha. He's the wisecracking friend that, you know, gets iced pretty quickly. Yeah, in the yeah, movie yeah. Side. That's funny. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how long I would last. In sl- I don't know. I don't know if I would last long, you know. I mean, if I'm being chased, man, I, I, I'm doing yeah, yeah. the best I can to get the hell away. But it's like, really? I mean, we, you know, we watch all these movies all the time. And we think, oh, come on, do this and do that. And it's like, well, let's just say you're presented with that situation. Yeah, right. Probably shit in my pants. Exactly. I, you know, find the best place to hide. And I stay there for like, I don't know, as long as I could. And honestly, I don't underestimate how far that'll get you in a horror film because how many there are always a lot of really bad decisions that that take place that allows that that particular slash or murder to take place so you know what i always maybe we would last longer maybe we would maybe we would maybe i just it always irritates me when they always and again i know it's for the sake of the movie but why do they always split up Right. Like, dude, why, if you got six of you, how about six of you stay together? Cause the six of you versus one is, is going to be a lot more effective than just one of you. Right. And, but again, it's a movie. So yeah. it's, you know, uh, let's see. Question number three, what is the worst nightmare that you ever had as a child or maybe a reoccurring dream that still haunts you? I had one nightmare as a kid. Um, and it was, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you now, and it's just not going to be that scary. It's one of those things like, I think nightmares, it's the, uh, it's going to take me a while to get to this. It's the feeling of anxiety that you have when you're having the dream. So what the dream is ostensibly about is probably not all that scary, but I have one that I am on my street as a kid. And I get dropped off in front of this house. So it's nighttime. There's mist. You know, there's yeah, everything. Yeah. And I'm laying in the front yard and I can't move. And I can hear something in the house just banging around, chains rattling, mm. like some kind of a beast or something is in the house. And it's breaking through shit. It's breaking out. Mm. And it's on its way to the front door to come and get me. And I just remember I had that dream once as a kid and I never forgot it. Really? So it was, you know, it was a full on horse drawn carriage that, that dropped me off, you know, up yeah, front. and I yeah. don't remember actually being dropped off because, you know, like in a dream, you, yeah. you, you didn't start there. You just kind of ended up somewhere and you know how you got there, but you didn't actually experience the arrival or the departure mm-hmm. for that matter. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that was the, the scariest dream that, that I've ever had. I I've had other dreams where like my mom turned into some kind of a zombie, <laughs> like she, her, <laughs> My mom's skin turned this gold, like, like literally like the, the metal gold. Yeah. And she became like mommy dearest. And I think it was right around the time I probably saw mommy dearest. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, as a kid. And, um, you know, that, that one creeped me out. But other than that, I, I have never really been plagued with nightmares. No, so. no, I guess that's, that's a good thing. But that having it that one time and it's still. So vivid, man. Yeah. That's what's crazy. That really must have messed you up, man. Well, you think of it, it's, is it vivid or have I just, you know, constantly been psychologically reinforcing it over the years? Maybe, you know? maybe, yeah. Is that the actual, that's something I think about is, is that actually how the dream took place when I was a kid? Mm. Or did I think about it 
two years later and I added a little bit to you, it. You could have been, maybe, maybe yeah, it's Or possible. maybe I've just gotten better words to be able to describe how it felt at the time. Yeah. And then that led to a little embellishment here, a little embellishment there, but fuck it. It's a story, man. It's you go story. for it. That's right? right. That's right. Um, cool, man. Uh, let's see. Question number four. Uh, what are your favorite horror sub uh, genres? And if you can think about it right off the top of your head, top three horror movies of all time. Top three horror movies of all time, easily The Exorcist, yeah. um, hands down. Uh, that's not just a great horror film. That's yeah. one of the my top five movies of all time. Yeah. Um, subgenres. I I do like the original um, the the original archetype movies. So I mm. I do like I like vampire movies, yeah. not counting the ones that you and I both know we're not going to talk about. <laughs> yeah. Uh, werewolves. <laughs> um yeah zombies uh i i i I don't know i just dig them like i yeah i'm not big on aliens except alien like i'm not scared of alien move aliens but um possession anything that has to do with the possession i i was brought up religious um so i think anybody that's brought up with any kind of strong religious background is always going to have that devil possession demons in the back of their head like is that shit real is, yeah is yeah. that real because it <laughs> might be real and i think that's probably why anything with some kind of a uh, a religious undertone to it yeah um still itches the back of my head sometimes i, I could see that especially if you were brought up that way but what's like yeah. an example of uh, like, like a subgenre? yeah um, you know, say ghosts, movies, uh, you know, I would say slasher would like be slasher. Say like, yes, a subgenre. I would say, you know, you could, you could argue, um, you haunting know, hauntings. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's so many of them anymore, you know, um, you know, be, people like some people are into the body harming. I, I, oh, whatever, body dude, horror, yeah. dude, I don't like that at all. I'm not a fan of that. Um, you know, like you said, I mean, you could you could argue like, say, you know, vampires, you know, or, or even werewolves, um, you know, stuff like that could be considered. I mean, I don't know if you would throw that under one category of, say, monster subgenre, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, um, you know, the religious stuff. Yeah, I, I, I was when I grew, I never went to church. Um, it just wasn't our thing. Um, and so my my only experience was when I was younger and and my dad took me to a, um, a, a what is it when they dunk you in the water uh the baptism. baptism dude that that freaked me out that was really like and that was when I was probably around 9 or 10 and my memory as a kid is horrible but I remember those things and that it just it was very unsettling for me like it felt so much like a cult or something and, well, yeah. and you, right i mean am i wrong is that it would that almost no, be like I a mean, cult thing i don't know uh, honestly that's that's kind of what i think and and i don't i don't i'm not here to bash anyone's religion but no, i think that what a what a religion is the difference between a religion and a cult is that you know a religion is socially acceptable for the most part yeah and then you have cults that do a bunch of weird things i mean if you think about how crazy is the are the clothes that the pope wears and the the yeah. cardinals and the imagery and the the things that they're carrying around even every everything down to a rosary true um what are these things what what do they carry with them like why what's the purpose of that if you if you're deeply into the religion there is a yeah. reason there is a purpose and these things can bring comfort but if you're standing on the outside of any of this like i was raised mormon Oh, so okay, uh, okay. I got baptized when I was eight oh, years you old, did. And, oh, man. but it wasn't like in a river. It was in a very, you know, uh, a, a room that had like a swimming pool in it, like uh-huh. a little hot tub that wasn't a hot tub. Okay. And, you know, I was baptized in there. You dress in white and you, you go in there and you get dipped in the water. Um, so every religion, every socially acceptable religion has these practices that seem really foreign and can be crazy or creepy to people on the outside, just like cults do. Yeah, I I agree, man. And I, and again, I, 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 you know, people have their own thing and it's, 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 it's cool for them. I just wasn't raised that way. And so I look at it from the outside and it just is, it's, it's strange to me. It's odd to me. Like if I was to go to church tomorrow, I hadn't been, I haven't been in church in who knows, 20, 30 years. I went maybe like once or something, you know, like, I think back in the nineties, I went to church uh, a couple of times when I was in the air force because, you know, 
on Sundays, you could go and go to church or you could go do other stuff that, you know, in the air force that it was like, Oh, you had to clean or do this. And I was like, Oh, I'll just go to church. Yeah. Even though, and I can't remember what it was. I don't know if it was Catholic. I don't know if it was Christian. I, I went with my buddy who was in the air force with me at the time. And, but it was, you know, if I went tomorrow, man, it was just, I'd find it so odd to me. And, and again, I'm not crapping on anyone's beliefs, not at all, but I, it's just, it was just never been my thing. And I don't know enough about it. Like, like you being baptized in white, it, why is that? Is that a purity thing? It, I don't probably. I'm to, I mean, yeah, I'm pretty maybe? pretty far divorced from it at this point at 43 years old. Yeah. Um, I know there was a there was a reason for it, but at the same time, as I'm getting older, like I'm I'm still I'm coming back around to these things. Like, yeah, these things are probably more good than harm. Whereas if I was getting to, you know, if you talk to me in my twenties, be like way more harm than good, way more harm than good. Yeah. Yeah. Getting to the point now where I'm like, ah, it's really not that bad. Yeah. If it yeah. brings people comfort. It brings people comfort. Definitely. Just like anything else. If your thought process, if your belief system makes you an asshole, then you're an asshole. It's not necessarily the, you know, the belief that makes you an asshole. It's that you're an asshole. Um, but if your belief system, if these things bring you comfort and they make you an accepting person of the world around you and it actually, you know, makes you love, then it's a good thing. Yeah, Dig, go with for, it. For Dig sure. It. For sure. So. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like I said, it's just it's not for me, it's, but it's for other people. And I, and I totally respect that, you know. Um, question number five. If someone offered you money to spend one full night in a haunted house, would you do it? I probably would. Yeah. Would you? Fuck No. No way I would do it. I just it. think, uh, I honestly, I might do it for free. Really? Just, oh, shit. It, it's an interesting thing about that. And <laughs> that's, um, that's something that uh, my mom told me once. And, and so if you grow up in a religious family and you, you are going to hear stories or you go to, I mean, it, it happened at the Mormon church I went to. I don't know if it's a commonplace thing, but yeah. people will end up telling you the stories about them them having encounters with demons things like that mm. um and i was listening to a story about somebody who was um i'm editing myself now because i'm i want to edit out the part where it was my mom telling me this because she'll probably listen to this and it'll hurt her feelings <laughs> if i'm talking about it something she said to me um is that she had a, she was sitting alone in her room and she had a very strong feeling of a demonic presence in the room okay and so she was praying and and having all of these things and i it was at my birthday party when i was 26 years old and i'm drunk listening to my mom tell me this story yeah and i'm like mom that pisses me off because you're a, you're a person of faith like you have faith and yet God is letting the demons come and mess with you like this. Yeah. I'm like they don't come into my room and mess with me. And she like <laughs> looked me dead in the eye and she's like, it's because they already have you. They don't need to. And that has always stuck with me. As a matter of fact, uh, the song that, that we're going to play actually has a line yeah. um, where I say like, my mom told me that the devil's got you now. And no it was, it's a lyric that, <laughs> that goes back to that conversation I was having with my mom that always stuck with me is that, yeah, the demons are going to try to mess with her. Um, it's because she believes that they're there and they're trying to, you know, attack her faith or attack yeah. her, her, the foundation of, of faith and love, whatever. Yeah. Um, whereas they don't need to bother me because they got me. Like I'm walking around, like, I don't care. And so huh. with that said, yeah. someone like me going into a haunted house, I'm just going to be walking around cynical not yeah. really scared that anything is going to get me mm. um and i don't know how that story is actually going to play out but yeah. Uh, yeah. i i would do it i i absolutely would huh. and i probably huh. wouldn't take that much money for no, me to go no. give it a shot shit i don't i don't even know what it would take for me to do it i i think it's like if because of all the horror movies i've watched and good we, we know they're not real i mean i come on doesn't mean that stuff isn't real but you know just the idea of, of do nah, I, I don't think I could do it, man. Like, I just, nah, I don't think so. If I had friends with me, that would, if I was by myself, no way. I just, I wouldn't. Yeah. And it would be some astronomical amount of money. Knowing it's haunted, knowing shit's going to go south, I don't know what that number is. But unless I had friends, if I had friends, okay, cool. Yeah. But no, dude, I'm just, yeah. 
I guess honestly, <laughs> I, I'm I'm thinking about it in the abstract right now. Like you, if you were to take me to the place, show me the house, <laughs> walk me through it before we got started, yeah, I might change my mind. Yeah, like uh, the 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 mansion in Hell Knight. Dude, it's, and I don't know if you've seen Hell Knight with Linda Blair, but it's a great 80s slasher. And every time I watch that, I've seen it several times. I know everything that's going to happen, but just the, the feeling of this big home and mansion, it just, it's eerie, man. And anything could be anywhere yes. at any point in time. Yeah. So I feel like the key to that is to just go to one room and don't fucking and leave just the room. Lock everything don't up explore. and don't explore. <laughs> don't go investigate what's going on down in the basement. I don't yeah. care what you hear. Just go to the room, close the door, pop an ambient, and go to sleep. Yeah. If there was no rules, like I could do that, then okay, I'm good. You know, but if if the rule was okay, well, you have to spend the night and you gotta you gotta go to each room. I'm like, yeah. screw you, man. Right. Doing don't that. start putting these rules on me, man. <laughs> Uh, that's hilarious all right last question man uh what do you want etched onto your tombstone oh, i haven't even thought about this he gave it his best shot all right hey man that's pretty good for right off the top of your head you know i'll probably think of something better something later. really cool yeah. later really yeah. profound well that's it man that's it for the six questions man you did pretty good all right let's talk hellraiser let's talk hellraiser i saw this movie it's funny, man. When this came out in 87, I was living in Reno at the time. I, I moved back to California. I was living with my dad um, in 87. And I think I moved back to California maybe about 88 or 89, I think. And I saw this in Reno. And I remember the, um, I remember the, the, the marketing for this. And I think if I remember correctly, and maybe you remember it, Stephen King goes, I've seen the future of horror and his name is Clive, Clive Barker. Barker. Does that sound about right? That sounds yeah. about right. I was like, oh shit, Stephen King is saying, saying this is going to be like phenomenal, you know? And I saw it and I, I, I liked it, you know, I liked it for 1987. Now, yeah. I am now watching this movie through the lenses of I'm almost 50. And I'll be honest with you, man. I found this boring a little bit. It does not hold up for me. And now, there are some great things happening in this film um, that, look, the Cenobites are phenomenal. Yes. I think, I think some of the practical effects are great. Music is, is I, I'm down for that. I think it's just, it felt funny to me. It felt, and I think they did film this. Did they film this in England or somewhere? It felt, it, it felt, it just felt odd. It didn't feel yes. like an American movie. Yes. And I think it was supposed to take place in the U.S., but maybe they filmed there for a reason, and it had that it had that feel to me. Um, a lot of overcast. It was just the tone, the color of the movie. I I felt uninterested, and and I just yeah, dude. I I just it didn't like I said. There's things about it I I dug, but I just as a whole, nah, dude. It 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 kind of fell a little flat for me. There there were definitely weird things about it. Um. So he Larry makes a comment when they are first looking at the house that you're on your home turf and she's the one that has an English accent. So immediately in my head, I'm going, oh. OK, they're in England now. But at the same time, you know, Kirsty's an American. Larry's an American. Steve's an American. Yeah. Um, I want to say that the couples that they are having the dinner party with. I think are they all American. Are. Yeah, I think so. But every character that she picks up at the bar that comes back. The, you know, the, her victims yeah. have English accents. And all so, look like Phil Collins. Yeah. And I couldn't figure, <laughs> I like, just like you, I couldn't figure out where it's supposed to take yeah. place. So yeah. he, uh, I feel like I'm going to go with England, but there's a lot of Americans there for some reason. And where's Clyde Barker from? Is he from England? Uh, he's from England. He's I, from England. I want to yeah. say he's from Liverpool. That if sounds, I'm remembering that that sounds about right. Yeah. So I don't, it, it had just. And I think I noticed this when I first saw it in 87, and then I've seen it several times since then. And I think as I've watched this over the years, each time I've watched it, I've lost more interest. I'll be honest. Last night I watched it for, this, for the podcast, even though I've seen it. I, but I wanted to a refresher, you know, kind mm -hmm. of refresher, you know, course. And, and, and I was bored. I kept going on to my phone, and I was looking, I, I looking at stuff on my phone, even though I'm, you know, the movie's still playing. And... It's just, that was, yeah. And, uh, and I, I don't think, even, oh, see, the thing is, I don't even, this is the thing with me. I own a lot of horror movies. I don't own Hellraiser one or two. I used to own them and I got rid of them because I just found them kind of not holding up and boring for me. 
Yeah, Doesn't... I got rid of them because I got rid of my VHS collection. <laughs> so I go. had yeah. the Hellraiser 1 and Hellbound Hellraiser 2, you know, variety pack that I had gotten at probably Tower Records or Tower Video or like at some point. Suncoast or yeah. something like that. Uh, yeah. Going back to the accents, um, there I know that there was some uh, conflict with the studio who didn't want they they did film this in England I'm pretty sure yeah um, and Frank the character of Frank Cotton had a very thick English a- or British accent yeah so they they required them to dub over Frank's voice so when you're listening to Frank talk yeah. it's very much like I'm brother Frank yeah and it's this terrible <laughs> it's, Hollywood it is, it's terrible yeah uh, accent and it's can I have a towel? And so the, a lot of that stuff is pretty distracting uh, when you're watching the film. It is. It is. Because I do remember reading that. And then I was watching it last night going, yeah, it's kind of noticeable. There was a couple like I want to say there was a there was a scene with I try to remember what it was. It was a it was a blonde lady. And oh, it was in the pet store. Mm-hmm. And you could clearly tell her her voice was dubbed over. Yeah. So it was like it was just kind of odd no, for me. It's like just it's it's cheap movie making. It was yeah. I think they made this this movie for a million dollars. Oh, is that yeah, right? And obviously, uh, you know, it was Clive Barker's first feature that he had directed. Um, you know, there's definitely things that uh, you look at it now and you go, your first year graduate from film school yes. is going to do these particular things really really well yeah um back in the 80s uh probably not so much but there's still something there that that isn't present in movies yep. that that are coming out today that are that look slick they look great you know your average car commercial is probably edited better than yes. than this particular movie. I noticed that last night watching it. Like I, you could tell it's his first feature film. He did like maybe a short prior to this and you could tell like he, he didn't know what to do. Like there were scenes, they were just there as like, uh, just kind of fluff, you know, like mm-hmm. let me add this, this and this, but for no particular reason, but I need to, I need to fill up some time. And so I'm going to add these scenes it didn't make sense. Like someone was walking and, and it just didn't feel natural to me. And I think that's a result of, Hey, I'm, this is my first film and I'm trying, I'm, he's probably learning a lot of it right off the cusp, right? Just be. Yeah. And so that's what I, that's what it felt like to me. Um, it does not mean like, like I said, I, I, there's, there's elements of this movie that are still great. Like the practical effects for the most part, not, I'm not talking about some for of the, the most cheesy. Part. Yeah. For the most part are pretty good. Not, not like the cheesy weird animation at the end, but you know, the Cenobites are great, man. I mean, they look good. Um, some of the effects when uh, I think when, when Frank is, when Frank is kind of reforming in that, that attic or whatever yes. that room is, you know, um, the wet room, the wet room, the wet room. <laughs> yes. That isn't bad. Um, I think my issue with it, and again, I, sometimes I do this and, and okay. So, so he's, we know, we know Frank is into some crazy shit, right? Yes. And he, I, yes. I think that this is where, you know, if you, if you read the book and where they could have actually making, made, making. Where they Make, make it. They could have <laughs> made this movie really, really delve more into what, motivates a character like him to get to the point where he is fascinated by this box. What is his motivation? Why does he want the box? What is this guy after? Um, They, something they could do now, which if they ever decided to remake this film, I would be very curious. They actually are. Yeah. (laughs) uh, To see how much more of this goes into when you have a, uh, you know, a country that's become obsessed with 50 shades of gray, at least Mm. a couple of years ago. The mindset of a character who is whose motivation is purely um, not just sexual, but pushing sexual experience to the ultimate level like S&M. Obviously, I think that Clive Barker is probably really um, uh, inspired by the Marquis de Sade. I I bet. Um, Yeah. And who is this character who's looking for the ultimate exploration of sexual experience and not just sexual but just the the experience of the of the flesh of the yeah. of nerve endings like what is the ultimate God, I'm not not 
can't think right. of the can't think of the word. It'll come. It's to killing you. me. It'll come to you. But the uh, the way that that you can just stimulate the nerve endings in your body to yeah. the ultimate, and it's pain, it's pleasure, it's yeah. sexual, it's all of these things, and so that's what he's looking for, and yeah. that's what ultimately pushes him to the box. Yeah. And what he thinks he is going to experience when he solves the box and what the reality of what comes out of the box uh, are two completely different things. They could have gone into much more detail yeah. uh, in the movie about that, in my opinion. Yeah, I just wonder, like, you know, can you get, can you, because I think it, it was probably already a hard sell with Hollywood, hey, you know, because I mean, they they want they didn't he wanted to use the the Hellbound heart. And they're like, now it sounds too much like this. Yeah, you need to change it all together. So it's like, you know, look, we're gonna let you do these things, but yeah, and I'm sure Clive Barker probably did. He probably yeah. wanted to. Exp- I'm sure. I don't know if there's a director's cut out there, and maybe he filmed stuff, or or maybe or maybe he didn't. Maybe he, you know they said no, 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 and and so he can never do it, and and the budget was so low, and you know, so it's like, you know. If he if he could do it, say nowadays, and he was throwing a ton of money, he probably would explore that. And, I and think aren't they so. doing a are they doing a TV show for Hellraiser? I, I thought they were. Was it an HBO Max thing? I want to say. I don't remember. I, I thought I'd heard this, but I'm not positive. I want to say I came across something that was um, saying that. I mean, like they 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 took this these characters and they took this story um, into comic books. I mean, there's like yeah. an entire comic story where Kirsty becomes the hell priestess which by the way oh. the hell priest is what pinhead is supposed to be called okay. like we, oh, i think we probably both know that yeah clive barker loathed loathed pinhead and yeah. that was just kind of the uh the nickname that they gave him on the set yeah when he was known as the hell priest but anyway uh Kirsty actually becomes the hell priestess oh. in, in some comic book uh interesting yeah so there's plenty of places they could go with this story, yeah. and I'm sure there's a well of existing material that they could do an entire series. Um, I think I'd heard they were. I, again, I, I I think they're rebooting it. They might maybe the reboot is the TV show, and I could be wrong on it, or it's it's a TV show and a movie. I'm not sure. I I always felt like it's funny, man. I don't. I'm not a huge fan of remakes, but I know sometimes remakes just are better. You know. Um, the, the the crazies comes to mind the the the, uh, the george romero one is a piece of crap it is hor- it's a horrible dude it takes me so much to watch it then the 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 remake they did i think with timothy oliphant was decent it was okay it was just better um i'm not a huge fan of the remakes because i feel like it takes away from the original but sometimes eh, it's just better i to me this feels like it needs a a revamp yeah. You know, yeah. like I'm watching this going, oh my God, and, it, like, cause the idea is so great, right? It's just, yes. it just seems like he, his inexperience, the budget, all of these things came in and they, and they hindered him. Yes. And, and so, and it's like, and I know, and I don't know if he, did he direct part two? I don't he remember. Did. He did. He probably had a little more money then. And there's some cool things in part two, yeah. but it still has the same feel. And it's like, and I'm just not into that. It, 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 part know. two is where I cut it off completely yeah. too. I, I. Everything after that, you know, we can talk about that later, but I think the mythology is, is pretty contained in part one and two. And I think that, you know, what are the Cenobites? Who are the Cenobites? Where do they come from? Is there's, there's kind of a a rich history in there and there's, there's more detail into that that could be gone on into in a movie or a series. Um, I would love to see that fleshed out more in something. Um, as far as remakes go, I'm, I know I shouldn't feel this way, um, but I am always interest, interested when somebody is doing a remake. Because yeah. part of the, one little hobby I always have in my mm. own head is that what would this movie have been like if it had been directed by so-and-so and not oh. the person who directed this? Yeah. What would this movie be like? You know, how would this character be different if it was played by so-and-so, not the person you know, who played it? Mm. So if somebody is going to do a remake, I know it's probably going to be terrible. I'm still interested if it's a movie I like that they're remaking, I'll still go see go, it. Go check it out. Yeah. It's not going to ruin the original for me. I think what happens so much more is that the movie looks better. It looks cleaner. The the actual craft of movie making is done better. True. The script is just garbage. Yes. I, I which, get on board with that. Yeah. Which it's crazy to me. Like that's the cheapest part of movie making is write the damn script. And, it, and the <laughs> right. script is where everything goes wrong these days, you know? Yeah. Yeah. 
No, like they I hear you. I hear you on that. Um, so I guess, man, you know, so we know Frank is look, he he's he wants to experiment. He gets the box. Uh, what happens to him? I mean, he's is he dead? That's the thing. It's like, where is he? Is he in some other realm? I mean, because yes, when when Julia and Larry move into the house you could, and you could tell right off the bat, Julia's a bitch. I do. Do you hate her immediately? And I'm, I do. And that's the idea. Um, the other she, thing, too, is I'm not she's not attractive to me. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not aroused by Julia. Not and they, they comment constantly in the movie about her beauty and about uh, in the book as well, that she's just yeah. this striking. Like I if they were to remake it. I would, and if this was 10 years ago, I would immediately have Julia would need to be played by Angelina Jolie. Okay. Someone where you look, you look at her and you just go, this is, this person is striking. Like, yeah, yeah. like she could pick up dudes at a bar. Whereas Julia just kind of looks like a CEO of, you know, Wall Street somewhere. Something you know, the way right? that like wearing a jacket dude. with shoulder pads and the hair just kind of. Dude, the hair reminded me of like Bridget Nielsen from like, say, Beverly Hills <laughs> Cop 2 or something or like Rocky 4 or something. Yeah. It just wasn't. It was weird to me. She wasn't that great looking. I mean, and yeah, dude, she was just a she's just a bitch. Like, I hate her immediately. And you, she's just so disinterested with everything that is happening with with her and Larry. Yeah. You know, and. And so when they move in this place, I mean, you could tell she doesn't want to be there, but then, okay, let's give it a shot, I guess. And, and, and it, and is it, do you think mainly it was to feel close to, to Frank because we know Frank was kind of squatting there? Yes. Well, I think honestly her, her distance from Larry is a result of her, the affair that she had with Frank before yeah. they got married. The way so, we see, we see yeah. it later on. So Frank yeah. seduces her before they get married and she falls in love with them and that's who she that's who she's in love with. So she's yeah. in love with Frank. And you see the gestures that she do when she finds pictures yeah. of Frank and she's tearing off the, the girl's head and putting it in her pocket. Yeah. So I think that explains her distance from Larry. Um, she's not in love with Larry. She's not in love with her husband. He's doing everything he can to yeah. kind of make create a life and set things up for the two of them. Um, and we all know it's just, it's not going to work. No, we, we, yeah, you could tell it's not. And, and so... So they move in and, you know, Larry, dude, I always hate this damn scene, man, where he, you know, it's coming, right? He's moving the mattress or whatever. And you know, it's that buildup and they it's that keep build cutting up. to it. And then it's like, oh my God. And he hits the nail and it rips the hand open. And ah, oh, dude, I hate shit like that, <laughs> man. I can't, I can't do stuff like that, man. I just, uh, and so he. He rolls upstairs and you find and, out Larry's a little bit of a bitch. Like, oh, I can't look. I'm going to throw up. Yeah, I'm going to faint. And, and she's like, oh, my God, you're, you'll be fine. Stop being a pussy. Right. <laughs> and the blood drips onto the, you know, onto the floor and it gets absorbed. And this is where this is where we get, you know, Frank, in a sense, kind of comes back, you know, portions of him, you know. Yes. But of course, as we know, he needs more blood. Which, okay, so explain this to me, man. And, and, and again, maybe, and I know it's just a movie, and maybe they delve into, into, the, into the book. Okay, so is he dead? Is, is Frank dead? Because underneath the flooring is something. And, and I don't know what that something is. It's, is it a heart? Is it just some, I don't know, man. Because as soon as the blood hits it and it absorbs it, it starts to create him. You know, and so what, what, where is he at this point, man? Is he, is he stuck in some realm somewhere is because, you know, later on, Kirsty says, Hey, you know, he escaped you guys, you know, what, well, what did he escape? Yeah. So I, and I could have this wrong. So I'm going to, I'm going to try to explain it as I understood it. Okay. And my understanding taking away from the books is that it's, it's not necessarily hell where, uh, they come from. It's, uh, it's, it's called the schism. The schism. Okay. And it's a different realm. It's a different dimension. Um, and so what happens is he opens the box and he has, he's taken by the Cenobites okay. across the schism to a different realm, a different dimension. Uh, um, when the blood is spilled on the site uh, where he was taken, I don't know if it's just the, it has to be the specific site. Like in uh, part two, you realize it, it, the blood needed to go on the mattress. mattress yeah. Yeah. Um, but 
the blood re you know helped to reconstitute. So I don't think his heart was there before the mm, blood hit the floor. I okay. think the blood hitting the floor, you know, by the time you arrive to that scene where it pans down, mm-hmm. um, you have seen the heart already starting to you know reconstitute under the ah, floor. Okay. Um, so you know that's one of those rules that you know in a movie now, if they remade it now, there would probably be some uh, interview where they got to go find a guy to talk to a guy. And the guy says, yeah, so, and he'll explain everything. You yeah. find all this out in exposition. <laughs> yeah. Whereas at least one thing that's good about scripts in the eighties is that they're not going to tell you, they're not going to regale you with the details mm-hmm. of exactly how it works. You have to kind of put it together yourself. Yeah. They just yeah. show you. And yeah. that's what I like about this movie is just show me. Just show me. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, he's able to escape the schism where he's essentially a, you know, a slave to this experience, the, yeah. the Cenobites play thing where He's getting what he bargained for, even though he had no idea what he was bargaining for. Yeah. And in one way or another, the blood being spilled on the floor of the scene, the site where, you know, he left or was mm. taken, um, brings him back. And so he, in that regard, has escaped the Cenobites. Ah, okay. That makes sense. See, and I knew, I knew it had something to do with, with in the book that I just wasn't catching, you know? Yeah. And it's hard to explain everything in a 90 minute or whatever, you know, movie. You, you just can't do and it. And we don't need everything explained. And, and, right? and we don't, you know, um, sometimes I, I want to fill in something. I just I just want to know. And that's why I knew you'd read the books and I wanted to ask you because, you know, you could add a little light on it. You know, it'd make a little more sense to me. I don't need everything. I, I'm, I'm cool with just my imagination at times, yeah. you know. Um, so so he comes back partially. Um, Julia finds him up in the room and she's startled at first, but you know, he realizes it's Frank and, and dude, she loves this guy. Right. I mean, she'll do anything for this guy. Yep. And that's hard. I like the effects on this is cool, man. I mean, this still looks good. Like the practical effects of, of Frank as, you know, he's still forming skin and all these things. It looks good. Yeah. In the remake, he would be played by Doug Jones, right? The uh, skinny guy. Yes, used to from put everything all, on. Yeah. Lord of the Rings or whatever. And yeah. And uh, what was he in? Is that is that Lord of the Rings? Oh, no. no the guy he, from. Um, from Guillermo del Toro's movie. Yeah. The, the skinny. Uh, Abe Something, Sapien, the water. Played, what was the t- something? Of, yeah. The, the shape of the water. The shape of water. Where he's um, basically playing Abe Sapien from the Hellboy. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I, I always think of the other, the Peter Jackson guy who always is, but he's oh, the Andy, short. That's Andy Serkis. Andy, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. He would be played by him. Yeah. Totally. But uh, the, the, the effects look great. Uh, they do. I think they still look great. I mean, it's a body, you would imagine a body decomposing this. We're watching a body recompose. Yeah. Um, and even the sounds, like the, the sounds of when there is a victim in the room and he's taking, like, if you take the, the sound of a, of a straw hitting the bottom of a milkshake, like the, oh my God. just the, the sound that, yep. that, that is just such a guttural, like, mm-hmm. like organic decomposing yep. flesh sound that I don't know, it gets, it still gets me. It, it does, man. It's the, it's almost the sucking, it's sucking the life out of, of, of a person, you yeah. know, that's really what is happening here too to regenerate his, his flesh, his skin. Yeah. And to me, it's, it's funny, man. It's like you go, so she picks up all these guys. And again, dude, like I said earlier, all these guys look like Phil Collins to me, man. (laughs) All of them, all of them, every one of them. And, and, uh, and it's like, okay. And I get, I get, I get, look, guys are horny and I'm going to just go to a random house and I'm going to go up to this strange room. And it's like, really? And okay. Yeah. I mean, I guess guys, you know, they, they want to get laid, man. And so, you know, she takes a hammer to what three of these dudes, or is it two of these dudes? Three of these, uh, three, three of, of these dudes, right? She picks up three guys, and and you know, and and slowly starts regenerating, you know, Frank's skin, you know, and and, and so, um, what's going on with Kirsty, man? Uh, Kirsty, you could tell. Look, I don't know. We don't know what happened to the mother. Yeah. We know she's probably deceased. Um, she's not a fan of Julia. You know, not that just because she's the stepmom, it's yeah. just because she's a bitch, right? I mean, yeah, and there, that's actually one of the changes from the book to the film is that in in the novella, uh, Kirsty is actually oh, Larry. Well, in the book, it's not Larry. His name is Rory in the book. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, Kirsty is actually an old friend of Rory's who is secretly in love with him. 
Oh, um, oh, wow! So I changed that, that up. That a bit. change, that dynamic of the relationship change, it works for me because if I was reading the book um, fairly recently, uh, and and I'm like, she's not his daughter, and I'd forgotten that. I read it in high school, you know, in the oh, 90s, yeah, yeah. And uh, I had never picked that part up. I just had seen the movie, and I assumed that it was Kirsty his daughter. And this last read that I gave it a couple of weeks ago, um, Kirsty is not his daughter; it's a friend. So it's like. Well, of course, huh. there's going to be a rift between Julia and Kirsty sure, because who yeah. is this broad hanging around <laughs> with my husband? I can I know that she's in love with him. Yeah. But at the same time, Julia's not in love with with Larry. Yeah. So maybe there would be an indifference there. I think the relationship change of making Kirsty, you know, his daughter, it works here because yeah. then he has a real motivation to facilitate their relationship. Um you know, I mean, think about asking your friend, your friend to go check up on your wife who's home alone, as opposed to having your daughter go check up on her stepmother who's makes home more alone. Sense, yeah. you, you want them to have some kind of a relationship. So it makes yeah. more sense to send your daughter to go check on your troubled, you know, wife troubled, at home while yeah. you're at work doing God knows what. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and, and that's where she, she finds, right? She finds this, I want to say, is the third guy. <laughs> yeah. Is this the third That's guy? That's the third guy. And you at the same time, you you go to the house. And this is one problem I have with the movie is like characters in movies, characters are always going to do something that you, you just don't understand why they do it. Mm. Um, she sees him. Uh, she sees Julia at the front door with victim number three and they go inside. And instead of just going leaving going to a phone being like dad yeah uh, she's she's banging a dude back at the house i think (laughs) you need to get home right now um or i think more likely these days a girl would you know kick the door down and start and confront the lady and be like get down here bitch cheating on my dad yeah instead she sneaks quietly into the house to get a better look at at what and so but that's what facilitates you know the third act of the of the film to start um Anyway, that's all I had about that. But it's just, why would she sneak into the house? Is she gonna, did she bring a camera with her? Is she trying to get photos? Yeah. I think it, you knew enough when you saw him go into the house with her, right? Yeah. I think for because it's convenient for the movie, it's like, okay, well, let's have her go upstairs yeah. and do this and that so we can do these other things. You there know? can be these startles, you know. Yeah, yeah. And this, you know, this this confrontation between Frank and and, and Kirsty, you know, um, and and her grabbing the box and you know, her throwing it out the window and, and so, you know, and then she, so, so explain this to me. And this is what I was trying to understand. Okay. I understand you just went through a situation. Okay. But you got out of there, you know, pretty easily and you have the box and all of a sudden now you're, I don't know, you're out of sorts and you pass out. I mean, is that the power of the box? Because it's not open. What, what's, what's going on there? That's what, and again, is it just a, it, it's just for the sake of convenience so we can get her in this hospital? Yes. I, okay. I honestly think it's the same thing when you need when when you're having an action movie and you knock a guy out because you need the the next, you know, sequence to be just between these two characters. Okay. So this guy got punched in the head and he's knocked out against the wall over here. Like, does that happen? No, it doesn't happen. Like you knock somebody out, they're going to the hospital. Yeah. I think this was very much just a she fainted from exhaustion and okay. shock and okay. she woke up in the hospital woke up so. in the hospital and then this is when she she plays with the box she opens yeah. it up we get this we get this scene with this this i don't know what this monster reminded me a bit of like say the thing and maybe in the mouth of madness and a few other like creature things it was okay it wasn't yeah. it wasn't great but it was I it hated was, it. I, did I, you hate I can't it? Stand, and what I think he, what I think that particular character is, um, to go a little bit more into the Cenobites and who they are, yeah. and how the the, the fandom kind of shaped the the way that the Cenobites are received now, is that there were four Cenobites. Um, you know, there wasn't Pinhead, Butterball, female Cenobite, and Chatterer. Yeah. Um, there were four Cenobites, and each of them kind of participated. There, there wasn't a leader or anything. Yeah. Yeah. But the way that the makeup um, was done on two of them prevented two of them from being able to speak lines. So their lines were given to Doug Bradley. And yeah. so by default, Pinhead became the lead Cenobite at yeah. the time. I, I read that as well. Yeah, yeah. And in the book, there's a fourth entity and it's called the Engineer. Um, and the Engineer is 
sort of the lead Cenobite who mm. uh, Pinhead has. I'm not sorry, Clive. I'm not. I know. I know. Uh, hate yeah, to say yeah. Pinhead, but <laughs> we're talking to the fans here. Uh, where he he has a, a line of dialogue that says, you know, the engineer will be around and he'll come in if the moment, you know, warrants. Ah. Um, and I believe that that's who that entity is. Um, and I just couldn't oh, stand that ending. Yeah, I, I it think wasn't it got a great to the character. point. Yeah, it got to the point in the movie where, where it's just weird, scary. Like, yeah, somebody do a monster guy over here where they did such great work with the Cenobites yes. and their look. And obviously that's Clive Barker. Oh, being, totally. And getting influenced a lot by if you look into it a little bit, you see that he was definitely intri- uh, uh, influenced by um african fetish sculptures if you uh, if you just do a google image search yeah. of african fetish sculptures you're gonna see a lot of where okay. pinhead came from yeah um and you know they look great and you look at movies that were later on influenced by that i i can't watch the matrix without seeing cenobites right. in everything yeah, that they're yeah. doing right um so that particular character was supposed to be the engineer the 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 sort of ringleader of the cenobites oh yeah, and it wasn't great. Like, I didn't hate it excuse. probably as much as you did. I wasn't a fan of it, but it, it just reminded me of other, just other things. And it was just, eh. Yeah. You're like, why is that there? What is its purpose? Exactly. It's just there to scare Kirsty. Yep. That's it. Uh, back to the room. Back to the maybe. room. Yeah. Which then I think, doesn't she open the box back up? And yes. then, and this is where we get, you know, the Cenobites. Yeah. And another thing that I, I don't think they um, really executed well in the movie was that the whole time that somebody is fiddling with the box and trying to solve it. Mm. Um, the box is kind of charming the person who is watching it. So you, you do kind of see it if you're paying attention that mm-hmm. there's, there's music and there's little sensations being, you know, flexed through the person that's, that's uh, solving the box. So it's not just a person fiddling with an object in their oh, hand. There's okay. sensations kind of happening. Because we're not, we don't get that in the movie. You, you we, get it a little bit. Really? If, you, if you're looking for it, you'll see little oh. things like that. You'll see like a little poorly drawn light thing kind of trickle up the person's arm. Oh, I did see kind of, yeah, some really bad animation weird yeah. stuff. Yeah. And there's a thing about that animation we could talk about later. But yeah, it, yeah. An interesting story about okay. that animation. Yeah. I mean, look, the stuff with the Cenobites, I'm, I'm all into, man. I love it. I, I love, uh, I love the look of them. I love everything about it, man. I even love the fact that I get, I, I did read what you were talking about where the makeup, they just couldn't do the dialogue, mm-hmm. but it, it's effective, right? When you got two Agreed. that just don't say anything. Yes. Because sometimes with me, some of the most scariest stuff is just n- don't say a damn thing. Exactly. And you that's know? why I think Chatterer is the most, most, awesome, most terrifying Cenobite. Easily. He is, man. And then, and then, you know, I love, I love Doug Bradley's lines in these. These are, these are like iconic lines, right? And him delivering them are awesome, man. I mean, so it's like, I'm all, I'm all for that stuff. And and I and there wasn't enough of that for yes, me. Yes, I think that um, I, I going back to the dubbing over of the lines. So Frank's cheesy dialogue yeah. over his dubbing line. I feel the same way about Pinhead's dialogue. The Pinhead will tear your soul <laughs> apart. Yeah. Or wait, don't do that. <laughs> it, it didn't work for me. No. If I would have. Love to hear uh, Pinhead's voice be much more seductive, mm. um, even if it if Pinhead's voice or kind of the character see the character be a little more androgynous mm. um, and have the voice be something. I, I wish I could give you an example of a person's voice that's that's very soothing, but something almost more feminine, um, oh, seductive really? and sexual. Whereas he's oh. very foreboding and you know that he's a yeah. bad guy yeah where the whole idea of the cenobites is people who are explorers in the further reaches of of experience you know um something just a little more that's kind of like you you don't automatically know that you don't want anything to do with these people yeah you whoever's trying to solve the box want something and they're after something and then when they get it i want them to still be kind of like oh i made a terrible mistake no like (laughs) is this what i want because this is scaring the shit out of me but it's i'm i'm still fucked up enough to want to go see what this where this takes me yeah 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 i i never i never 
I never minded his voice. I, the fact that he's got the accent on top of it, I think it adds to this mystique of this this voice. Um, you know, I, like I said, I don't I don't have issues with it. I'd love some of the lines. Um, you know, like I said, over the years they just become iconic. Yeah. You know, um, what what is the one uh, the box you opened it? We came or yeah. something. It's so simple, man. It's so simple, but it's powerful. Yes. You know, I love shit like this. And he's describing, you know, what they are. She's she, she, you know, this is the as much exposition as you're going to get. You know, we're explorers in the further reaches of existence, angels to some, demons to others. There you go. Um, and I really like that about the first two movies is that they are just there for the flesh they are there to grant experiences of the flesh to yeah. to see how far um you can take that whereas later on in the in the the few of the later sequels that i see he becomes this evil entity he becomes a demon he becomes satan he becomes yeah. a bad guy whereas it's really ambiguous in these first two movies it's like he's not evil he's not good he's completely ambiguous he's indifferent yeah. to that like yeah he's transcended good and evil he's just you know in the realm of experience and nothing more you know yeah yeah i i i i start i think i stopped at like part three i was done like after three it was just boring for yeah. me and i just didn't need all that other like if you're gonna do like a let's say you're gonna do a mini series of you know uh i keep, i hate saying pinhead but let's just say his character you know um you know, you're going to follow him for a, a series of, say, six episodes. I'm down for that. Yeah. I don't want to see a, a minute or two in a movie. It just, I, again, like sometimes it's just not knowing stuff. Then it leaves my imagination to kind of fill in blanks. And I'm all for that. Like in part one and, and two, I was, I'm, I'm cool with that. I don't yeah. need all this other stuff. I yes. found it boring for me. And, and I felt like it almost didn't belong, you know, like they, like they were running out of, ideas or stories and we had to throw this in as as whatever and i just eh, you know and i know they've done like bazillion movies i don't even know how many they've done but yeah. I, I just i was good after th honestly three sucked you know the thing is with hellraiser with me and i've said this on the podcast before is is i like i respect i respect where this see this this we'll call him a monster you know we'll call pinhead you know and i know mm -hmm. there's the other three but but he's the one that people know. Yeah. We're going to call him a monster. And I respect his place in, in all the monsters over, you know, um, you know, the Jasons and the Freddies and the Michaels and all and Chuckies and all them. And I respect that his place and, you know, um, but as a series, I just was bored with it. It just didn't do it. It's like, yeah, it's like Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I've, I've also said that. And again, I don't want to piss any fans off. I just wasn't into Leatherface. It didn't do anything for me. Like I, I'm not a fan of the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I appreciate, you know, I appreciate the movie and where it stands and say like history of cinema and, and yeah. but I just, it's not my thing. And so he's a one dimensional character. You know, you, you, you can learn in 30 seconds what Leatherface's motivation is and he doesn't deviate too far from that particular motivation whereas yeah. I think someone like Pinhead and the Cenobites there is a universe worth of different things about that how True. did he become you know yeah. how did he become Pinhead did he yeah. it, you know all of these things um you know what is the the Cenobites are a group they're members of the order of the gash which is like kind of like this weird priesthood in mm, hell okay um and it, there is where okay who started that what's that see, all about that's, see that's there cool. is there is a wealth of you know places that you could go dig and 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 go to a yeah. story but what would they do if they did a series is they would create these you know, fictionalized human characters and make it be about a drama between them. Yeah. And then Pinhead would still be off in the periff somewhere. Yeah. Uh, you know, not going into any of that stuff. So I just, that's, that's what my fear would be if they, when they do do this series. And I don't know what, what they're going to do. What you're saying sounds hella cool. Like I'm, I'm bored for that, man. Like I, I'm cool with that. Like I, I love, I, I, if you're going to give me a backstory, then do it right for me, yeah. you know, execute it correctly and give me everything like, you know, like, um, or you don't have to give me everything. Just give me enough and in proper doses to okay. keep me coming back for the, more. There, there you, know? you go. Yeah. 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 That that's true. You know, it's, it's, I, 
look, I love, I love, I love knowing about a character. You know, if, if you're giving me a 90 minute movie, I understand that you're limited on what you can give me. I get that. And, and it's hard sometimes to convey certain things. It, yeah. it just is. If you give me six hours of say a, a mini series, man, you got, um, you got ample time to do yeah. all of these things. And, and I'm down for that. And, you know, and I could change my mind completely about say, Hellraiser as a whole, or you know, you know, the the, the character. You know, it's, it's not that I don't like the characters. I do. I I I, I the Cenobites. I'm all I'm all, I'm down for. Man, I I dig these things. I you know, um, I guess to me it's just in the 90 minute movie or whatever this was. I don't remember if it was 90 or you know 100. It's just there's not enough. There's not enough of the Cenobites for me. Yeah, and all the other stuff is is I'm bored. I'm bored. I don't. I just. I don't know, man. They and did spend too much time, I think, on the human part of it. Like the human characters are just not that interesting, right? Like, like they could have. Who could've. are you rooting for? You know, you, at first you think the the central character is is Julia, right? You, we could say that she's the protagonist in the yeah. beginning because she's the one we're focused on. Well, we don't like her very much. She's not a very likable character. Yeah. And then you might think that it's Larry. Well, he's not a very likable character he's not either. That. And then you meet Kirsty, and you realize, okay, the second half of the movie really is is it's Kirsty's movie. She yeah. becomes our protagonist, and she's likable, but and there's been okay. enough. Yeah, yeah, there's yeah. there's there's just been too much bouncing around between these people. When you're like, who the fuck are those guys? Yeah, and yeah. tell us about that. Yes. you know, and have a little bit more than just that, you know, exposition about it. But you can't do it in, in 90 minutes. No, and you, know? you can't. And, and if you are going to try to do it in 90 minutes, you have to have some actors with chops to do it. Yeah. And I'll be honest, man, Kirsty for me is a, is a dud. It was her like, first. Look, I, no disrespect to Heather Langenkamp, okay? Um, she got better, you know, as she got older. But in the first Elm Street, she's terrible. Yeah. She's horrible, man. And she's your main, she's your, your final girl here. And she's terrible. And, and, and so this is Kirsty for me. And I, I almost want to say this was her first film. Cause I thought it said it was and, introducing Ashley Lawrence. And I guarantee you, Ashley Lawrence has, has done so many more films and she's great now. And I, and, 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 and hopefully if she listens to it, please don't take it personally. It's just, it was your first film. And, and you were almost asked to kind of carry the second half of the film. And you just, at that point in your career, you just weren't there. And you know what? And I, so I'm going to disagree with you there. I yeah. thought there was just. Ashley Lawrence had a face that I gravitate toward, and I thought that she had a great face. And, and for what she was given, the 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 you know the the dialogue that she was given, it didn't. It worked for me. I it thought did? she did fine. Okay, okay. Um, you know, I, I she, it wasn't uh, Oscar worthy or anything like that. No, but, no. And I don't expect that in a horror yeah. movie. I look, I I've seen a lot, and I can tolerate a lot. And I just wasn't, I just wasn't into her. Like I just. I didn't care like if she died or not. It sounds terrible, but if she died, I didn't care. Like if any of them really died, I didn't care. Yeah, I was I was fully expecting Steve to die at some point. I thought Steve um, would die too. And uh you and know, did something you... that they remedied in uh in Hellbound and Hellraiser 2. There was the guy that kind of took over as the boyfriend trope. Yeah. And Julia aced his ass. Yeah, and it's like the characters for me, I wanted to like them and I just found I just didn't like I didn't recognize the only person I like I recognized was Larry and I re and I remember him from being the the killer in Dirty Harry um but that was in 1971 which was what 16 years earlier yeah um which is crazy to think Dirty Harry was damn I was born in 71 I'm almost 50 Jeez. Dirty Harry is 50 years old isn't that nuts to think about? That's crazy. I mean, hell, Clint Eastwood's what in his nineties or something, or yeah. close to a hundred. I think Clint Eastwood's gonna outlive all of us. I think he is. But uh, it'll be him, Willie Nelson, <laughs> and uh, Keith Richards. Keith Richards. <laughs> I uh, I was talking with my son earlier. We were talking about something, and and Kirk Douglas came up, and I thought Kirk. I, I guess he died last year, but he was one hundred and three. Yeah. I mean, dude, that's crazy. We were talking about all the stuff that he w lived through and saw. I mean, some good and a lot bad, man. I mean, yeah. you know, all the wars and everything you would see, you know, I don't know if I'd ever want to live that long. Well, I, 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 like I never to think, want to live my kids like ever. Yeah. Like that's, that's a given. Happen. Yeah. No, yeah. Nobody should have to watch, you know, go back to a line from Lord of the Rings. No parent should have to bury their child. Yeah. Um, but I, I, 
I tend to not get too caught up on the things that celebrities had to go through in during the course of their, you know, celebratory life. True. Yeah. Um, so yeah, 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 there's a lot of things that, um, you know, uh, Douglas, what's his name? Kirk Douglas. Kirk Douglas. Yeah. Kirk yeah. Douglas. Yeah. Things yeah. that he went through. I mean, he was fucking Spartacus. He was. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he read about it, but, <laughs> but anyways, man, yeah, but again, just... the, with the characters, I mean, you're right there. I mean, they, they didn't have, um, you know, like at the time, what kind of, you know, talent are you going to get for these movies? And that's not a knock on, on the actors that were in no, this no, film. No, no, not at all. It's it, kind of yeah. like the, the entire process. They, you know, Clive probably wasn't sitting there obsessing over the emotional performance of the characters. And at the same time, for what it was like that, that, that drab universe that they were living in, it looked like that it was being filmed in winter too. So yeah, I didn't did. remember seeing any leaves on the trees or any life out there. Like there was kind of like this drab, you know, apathetic depression happening at the time it and everybody was dreary. just connected from each other do you think he did that on purpose do you think because of the scope of the film do you think he he made it feel that way it just yeah dude it was so blase and just maybe it, it did feel depressing to me watching it like yeah where it, it just kind of came around to it that i wasn't you know particularly as a kid attracted to um to the actress that played uh to claire higgins at the time yeah um I do remember, and maybe this is because when I saw it for the first time, I was probably 11 or 12. So I'm going to think of Julia more as my mom. I'm not going to be attracted mm. to uh, the person said it, but I was attracted to Ashley Lawrence. So, and I could see that. Yeah. And that's yeah. probably why I didn't have a problem with her performance is because I thought she was foxy when I watched the movie mm. when I was a kid. And so sure. I still think she's hot now. Yeah. Um, oh, very attractive now. Yeah. I, so I met her a couple years ago at a what was it uh the sacrament of the sinister con uh she was there with doug bradley nice i yeah doug bradley was there i had him sign a i don't know i think it's in my room i'll show awesome. it to you but it's like i had him sign a, a poster i didn't get a chance to talk to him which was a bummer because he had a long line which which makes sense yeah i would have liked to have loose chatted with him but she was super nice awesome like yeah she um my goddaughter uh shaley got something uh signed by her and she was so nice to her dude she chatted with her and i mean it was just like that's the stuff i like to see instead yeah. of someone that just signs next and signs next which a particular i won't i won't mention her name but a particular actress in uh the exorcist um someone can fill in the blank right now if they want to she was quite um i don't know I'm not going to say she was really rude, um, but yeah, uh, my buddy and I waited in a line for like two, two and a half hours wow. and she was really short with us and she nexted us. And I thought that was really, I'm like, I, I, I stood in this line for this long to meet you and to have something signed, which I really didn't need to, cause I already had something else signed. Yeah. And, and this is what I got. And I was, I was a little put off by it and maybe it was just a day. It was just, maybe it was just that day. Um, I don't know. Um, but I like when like, like Felissa Rose from sleepaway camp, she was phenomenal, man. I mean, like yeah. you, you meet some of them and you, you're like, oh my God, this is the way everyone should be. Mm -hmm. Or if you meet someone who played in say gremlins and, and that particular person is a complete asshole to you. And it's like, okay, so, you know, I think that's why I haven't actually gotten out to any of the cons or anything or tried to meet any celebrities. I've, I've never done that, but because I just expect that. The putting somebody in a position where they have to meet 500 people yeah. in over the course of six hours and every single one of them is trying to impress you in some way and you need to to be memorable. You have to constantly be on and constantly be nice and chipper. And then it's the one or two times in that day that you that you slipped up, that you yeah. stubbed your toe and you slipped up and you just you you your guard went down and you yeah. were rude that people are going to remember for the rest of their lives. and. And I would just expect that, like, there's no way in hell that I would be able to sit in a, in a chair signing things for six hours and be nice to everybody, which is why it's so awesome when you meet people that, that are just gracious yeah. and awesome and they get it that I need to, I need to charm 500 people <sighs> in a row yeah. right now for the next six hours. I, I can see, I can see, you know, I mean, I understand that part of it. I can and, see and, being tired yeah. and, and letting your guard down, but it's never, ever justified 
being an asshole to somebody. I could tell you this, and I know we're getting off on, on a little bit. I, I met Robert England. Uh, this was probably three or four years ago at some Sacramento one here. And I waited in line for a while. And, you know, and during the course of the day, can you imagine how many people go to see Freddie? Right. I mean, this is Robert yeah. England here. You know, he's been a lot of other stuff, but come on, we know him by Freddie. And I, and I waited in line and, um, and I get up there and he's got the glass of wine right next to him, which was just funny. You know, he's drinking wine and, but he's sitting there and he's, I, I can't tell you how many hundreds of people that he had signed autographs for, but he treated me like I was the only person. Nice. And, and we're chatting a little bit. And then I sat in on a panel with him and what, what a, like the, one of the nicest guys you could ever like meet or listen to, like, can you imagine how many panels he sat in since Elm street came out? Let's just say, you know, and what was Elm street 84 or something like that? I, mm-hmm. I may be off by a year or two, but 84 and we are now in 2021. I, I dude, hundreds upon hundreds, right? He's probably been asked tens of thousands of questions, but he answers them like it's the first time he's ever heard it. Yeah. And then he tells you a story. That's the shit I love, man. And, and I he dig tells it. it with, you know, enthusiasm, yes. like it's the first time he's gotten to tell the story. Absolutely, yeah. man. And, and, I, and I'm that's sure that's how. Yeah. And that's and, somebody who cares. That's yeah. somebody who puts effort in. Yeah. Anyways, I don't know why we got on for that. But, you know, <laughs> um, anyways, man, I know we're getting close to the end, right? I mean, we got um, so. OK, so we know we know uh, Kirsty is going to get out of the hospital and she is going to head back to the house and she's looking for pops, right? She's looking yeah, for Larry. She's worried about her father. She's looking for She's yeah. seen Frank at the house. She's yeah. seen Julie. She knows they're in cahoots. Something nefarious is happening back at the house. She's going to go back to her father to make sure he's okay. Correct. And so we get there and and Julia, we don't see, we, it's kind of like off camera or whatever, but we see Julia bringing Larry up. You know, Frank needs basically one more body to be full here. Now, this is what I didn't understand. And maybe you could clarify this for me. So he's, did he just rip? <laughs> I, I, I He didn't right. rip off. Larry's skin, he I he basically kind of sucked him dry, right? He sucked the life out of him. I because think he had to take the he had to rip the skin off. Th- because he looks yeah. like Larry. Because and yeah, he, he sounds looks like, like Larry, which to me doesn't make yeah. any sense. But and that, okay. that was one of those things like I'd noticed it too, and I just yeah. think that they they had to do. It. I mean they they have to, yeah. right? Yeah. Um but uh because you there's a gesture that he makes when he's walking down the stairs and he puts his his fingers in between each other as if he's making a pair of gloves fit. Uh, um, okay. so he has taken the skin, which okay. just raised questions for me when I saw that, because if he continued to get more bodies, is he eventually going to sprout new skin or is the last step going to be ultimately you got to steal someone's skin? Um, I, and what that, happens later? Does that, does, are you going to make the skin work? Is that, are you, is that your plan, Frank? Are you going to, are you and Julie going to bail? And then you're just going to walk around with, <laughs> you know, a dying man's decomposing skin on you. Yeah. So. These are the questions I have. Obviously, that part of it does get answered in Hellbound 2. Which That's is what I was going to say, because Julia grows she, her own skin back. Yeah, she yeah. does ultimately reconstitute. Yeah. And, and, you know, she does it in two bodies. Like, maybe it's because of the amount of blood that was spilled the first time when she escaped the mattress. Yeah. Um, it was just a couple of drops for Frank when, when Larry's blood hit the floor. Um, you know, all of these little inconsistencies that are going to drive geeks like us yeah. crazy like the what if well if, if that what about this uh-huh. and, and things like that but yeah so i mean you know we know we know larry's dead and we know frank's got his skin and but christy doesn't know this nope it doesn't take her too long to figure it out yeah but just, i mean to me it was like well you don't see all the blood on him and stuff yeah, I despite mean, it, <laughs> everything going on around the hairline right? and uh and <laughs> just the generalized he's not acting like himself and we know <laughs> We know Larry well enough at this point to know he's not acting like himself. And, you know, we, I would imagine Kirsty would pick up on that before I would. Yeah, I would so. think so, too. But I mean, yeah, so this all comes kind of down to the climax, right? We she makes I think she makes a run for it downstairs. And I, I'm trying to remember this. Don't the Cenobites don't the Cenobites show up in one of the. I know she's hiding yeah, from. It's a little weird how they show up, how, you know, how they arrive and how they don't arrive. Yeah. And it's, I think 
and there's a lot of going into different rooms. This there part is, is this, this part is. doesn't to... work for me. Like the very last bit of the film doesn't work for me. Anymore. Yeah, because I'm trying to figure out what's happening. I know, I know. Kirsty goes downstairs, and I think Julia stops her. And then there's a struggle, and basically Frank stabs Julia. Doesn't yes. seem to care. Like it's so, no big deal to him. Yeah, Julia is is holding Kirsty. Um, you know, uh, Larry's dead. So I I can only assume their plan is to kill Kirsty. Uh, get one more body for Frank. So Julia is holding Kirsty. Frank goes after her with a switchblade, and at the last minute, uh, Kirsty's able to duck out of the way, yeah. and Julia gets the knife instead of Frank. And Frank is just looking for one more body. He yeah, doesn't he care, care if it's Julia, and he never <laughs> did, by the way. Yeah. And so he just leans into her and says, nothing personal, baby. <laughs> and you're like, that's pretty cold, man. It is way cold, man, because she's a, she loves this guy. He's infatuated by it. Will do anything, and she yeah, has she done anything. She would do anything for him. And and he just he's a user, man. He doesn't yeah. care. Yeah, you're a, a not you're nothing to me. Great one off story um, is that when you were mentioning earlier that the uh, the novella the novella is called the Hellbound Heart. Yeah, and the studio didn't want him to use the Hellbound Heart because it sounded too much like some kind of a romance movie. It does. And it does. And so yeah. they were going back and forth trying to figure out what to call it. And the story is that um, so one of the, the crewmen in the in a woman in her 60s suggested that they call the film what a woman will do for a good fuck. <laughs> oh, shit. Like, so be it. So <laughs> for a short period of time, maybe the movie ends up being called what a woman will do for a good fuck. And they settle on Hellraiser and we'll take it. Yeah. But. She has put everything into this man, and and he's just a user. He took her, and it, it was no different. No, when we all saw that coming. We know yeah. Frank didn't. Frank doesn't give a shit about anyone but himself, and he never has. Well, you could tell too. It's like you're going through all these photographs, and you see woman after woman. Julia, come on, yeah. man. But I mean, you know, if if and, you're if you're if you're hooked, you're hooked. Yeah. And speaking of being hooked. Yeah. So there's another little inconsistency in the movie there because Frank stabs Julia yeah. on the stairs, right? Um, and then he does the uh, chocolate milkshake, bottom of the milkshake noise where he's <laughs> sucking the life out of her. And that all takes place in the stair landing. Mm-hmm. Um, fast forward to after Kirsty's coming downstairs and she discovers Julia. Like, and you think you assume that she's dead now. She has died yeah. in the landing of the stairs. But she comes back out and her skin's gone. There's chains coming out of the mattress. She's lying on the mattress having yes. been flayed or something. And she's the one she's holding the box. This makes at that no point. sense to me. So how did she get there? That's, I didn't, that's what I, I noticed that last, I noticed it before. Is, is it just because they wanted to use, they wanted to do something cool. Let's use chains in a box. It, it didn't serve a purpose yeah. for me at all. I mean, it served a purpose for the sequel, obviously, that mattress comes into play. Okay. But yes, you are right. And you yeah. think, okay, at the last minute, did Clive Barker go, oh shit, I have this idea for the sequel. Do you I, think? I need that? Maybe. That's otherwise, the only explanation. Otherwise, yeah. Otherwise, you know, hey, my, my mind, in my mind, I see the sequel that she comes back, but how is she going to come back if she dies on the stairs? The sequel can't take place in uh. the same house as the first one. So let's say it's um, she dies on a mattress. Huh. I can move a mattress. I can take a mattress sure. to a different. OK, I, I, I could see that. I, do you think he thought that far in advance? I don't know. I, I, I honestly That's the only don't explanation, know. though. That's it, man. Um, it, it is too much of a coincidence for me to think that she inexplicably changes positions after her death. And uh, and then that where she dies becomes an integral part of the plot of the second film yeah so yeah. i would suspect something was going on it there. had to have been because because if not it just seemed it just seemed out of place and just kind of just cheesy for me like it didn't work for me but if that was the case okay yeah. then 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 i can i can get on board with that i guess i mean and it wouldn't have been that much uh you know maneuvering to get her to have actually died there in that room like sure he yeah. stabs her on the stairs they turn a corner and enter the room and she falls back onto the mattress and then suddenly inexplicably the chains come and get her too sure. because it's hellraiser and these things are just coming out of nowhere sure um so it, it does also strike me as something that was added after the fact later Yes, I, yeah. I, yeah, I, I think I agree with that. Um, but I mean, we're we're just about at the end, man. We got a, uh, we got Kirsty has to get Frank to admit yeah. 
you know, hey, I'm Frank yes. and I've escaped and blah, blah, blah. And and, you know, and he does that in the Cenobites. The Cenobites show up and, and you know, they're almost, you know, they're here to kind of collect again right they're 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 almost here to shove you back into this what did you call it the the schism the schism, the schism. Uh, now i n- was never clear on whether the schism was the bridge between these two realms or if the schism was the other realm that that oh. they're taken to or is that you know the schism just the bridge and then where they are going is actually hell it might oh, it, it could might be might be. i mean it makes sense right i mean it makes sense to be hell but yes, so the Cenobites show up and they're here to collect Frank and they yeah. reveal themselves. They've been listening all along. They yeah. pop out from behind a house plant or something. But. <laughs> something in this empty room uh, in the shadows or something like that. And yeah, man, I mean, chains everywhere. Okay, so the chains to me seem just kind of lazy, right? I don't know. I, like, the now, you don't think well, so? Well, they're like, part of it. They're, they're part of, you know, it's the you have been hooked. It's kind of like, you know, people that are into weird S&M shit. You know, they pierce their nipples. They enough? pierce their dick. They pierce their tongue. Okay, so you think so, so it, just the hooks alone is hooks, enough to convey that. Yeah, okay, the hooks okay. on the flesh are part of the stimulation. You know, Okay, the, okay, the, all right, I guess so. And, to me, I just felt like it was like, could you, could you do some other cool shit for me? I guess he, <laughs> that's where I come in. It's like, I want like something... I, hooks are cool that's yeah. cool but give me some other things that these centibytes can do yeah but but yeah i mean i get what you're saying i well, mean i think honestly if it if they had played up to more like it, they were pushing the torture part of it a little too much if they had amped up the sexuality of it that if you have something along the lines of and the way that that geiger when he was designing the alien, there was in the way that in Alien, the alien killed everybody was very metaphorical of I, I just got all sorts of rape. Like there was mm. assault, sexual assault. Oh, yeah. There was something sexual about every every killing an alien. If you had kind of taken some of those elements and made every bit of torture that happens in Hellraiser also have a sexual element to it, um, it. That's what I always said when I read the book and I yeah. had that there was always this guy's looking for the ultimate sexual experience. Yeah. And if there was something more than just, you know, torture to it, um, that would have been much more shocking to me. Not that I needed to see that, not that anybody's yeah. psychology needs to endure that. Yeah. Um, that if you wanted to shock me, that would have been taking things more of that route would have yeah. would have would have yeah. done it. anyway. For the time, though, you know, I don't think they can get away they with that. They weren't going to get away with any of you that. Can, you can almost, there's some stuff you could get away with as we've gotten, you know, closer to, say, 2021. But yeah. but even, but I think over the past year or two, you're starting to see kind of a backtrack where there's certain things you can't, you can't, you can't do anymore. Like you could do certain stuff in like, say, human centipedes and weird shit like that or hostile or I've heard of some mm-hmm. other really outlandish movies where they've done some just bizarre yeah shit. i won't watch those i'm but. getting to the point in my life i mean when i was in my 20s i was like i want to fucking see it yeah. i want to show it to me i want to see it i'm getting to the point now where you know my dad's words in my head is like there's some things boy that you can't unsee yes and you know they go back to the <laughs> when you stare into the abyss you know the devil doesn't change the devil changes you all that yeah, stuff and yeah. you're like i don't need to see some of this i stuff. don't need i don't need that man i'm just not into that shit but there are a lot of people that are and that's okay that's your thing whatever man i just it's not my thing and so but i just don't know you know 1987 you can't really i yeah. mean look i mean you could you could argue like you know cronenberg did some weird shit you know there's there's some weird movies out there where they did like society comes to mind, um, you know, um, I would almost, I mean, reanimator is kind of on the cusp. I'm not yeah. saying like, you know, the same, the same type of movie, but they did some stuff, you know, um, I'm trying to think of some other movies, you know, out, out there that you could almost call it body, whatever body horror. And, and, um, I can't think of it right now. Uh, maybe video, what is it? Uh, What's the one with James Wood? Is it something dr- uh, video drone video drone? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, some, uh, some of those on those lines, but yeah. see again, those aren't Hellraiser was a theatrical release. I think some yes. of those other ones were not, I mean, those probably straight to VHS or something, you know, uh, a lot of the, those movies in the eighties are going to be a blur to me because I obviously being raised 
and being a kid that was eight or nine years old in the eighties yeah. and being raised in a Mormon household, oh my, my first introduction to all of these things <laughs> were walking past them in a blockbuster. So I'm yeah, not going to remember yeah. the theatrical release of anything, basically. <laughs> true, true, true. Um, well, anyways, man, we have, we have like, so this is, I mean, look, when we know Frank gets it right, chains yeah. and basically they tear them apart. I love this part though. This, this Jesus, what was yeah. it? Because they changed the line, right? It yes. was supposed to be originally like "fuck off." It was or supposed to be "fuck you" or "fuck off" yeah. or something like that. And that is like that's going to be imprinted in my head until the day I die. The image of Frank basically with his arms outstretched, crucified yeah. in a way, with half of his face being stretched off, and then when he licks the outside yes. of his mouth, <laughs> that is. <laughs> terrifying it is stuff. terrifying man. and so he says jesus wept and he laughs a little bit and that was the only time that you get the inclination that there is something pleasurable about that yeah. to him there's an element of stimulation going on to him and then of course he just gets ripped apart. gets ripped apart man and then i mean the house starts to fall apart the cenobites mm -hmm. come after kirsty and that's where I, the movie goes way downhill for me yeah it does it's it's again i don't know if this was like was this the original ending or did they have a, something else in mind? I do. I did read that they literally ran out of money. They ran out of money. <laughs> that was it. And then the, all of those special effects oh, were, were uh, Clive Barker and another man, I forgot his name, um, completing the movie and the special effects over one drunken weekend is the story. I, I read the same thing. Yes. I'm like, okay, I get it. And so, you know, I read it and then rewatching the ending going, okay, I'll, I'll give him a pass. Yeah. But it's like damn it's and that's what i see a lot with movies especially horror movies it's like you have these these larger than life like ideas and then you either run out of i i, I think most of the time it's you just run out of money like you know i don't think it's running out of gas i think it's just running out of money and this is a perfect example like i'll watch a movie and i'm like god this was great for an hour and 10 minutes yeah and then you just stunk it up in the last 20 minutes why did you do that it's i honestly i think it's you know if you have plot threads and they're starting to unravel as the movie begins well you have to figure out a way to wrap that story back up and take it back to a singular point and what were they going to do like what was she supposed to do how was she i i just don't like the way that she was able to escape she had to like literally point the box I at know. each of them yeah. and solve the puzzle back to its <laughs> original you know cubic form and she's pointing it at him like a gun and then it goes away and then she oh there's another cenobite over here yeah. she's got to point it at that cenobite and solve it again in some way and that one disappears and then you know uh the house is falling apart and While butterball the house is, comes yeah. up behind steve and then he just gets like uh crushed by a falling debris from the house so is he still there because he didn't disappear yeah he just got smashed yeah but yeah it, it, it i get running out of money I get it, but just don't be lazy about the ending for me. Find find an alternative. Yeah. As a if you're a creative person, you're you're a writer and you're now a director and you're doing these things. All right, give it some thought. How can I do this yeah. on a shoestring budget? I have no money left. Okay, what yeah. can I do to salvage this ending? And I think that that's where the script comes mm -hmm. in. It, yeah. it, it does feel very much like they didn't know what to do with the end of the movie. Yeah. I did like how it, in a way it did tie it up into a nice little bow at the end where I, the box ends yes. up exactly where it was when it started. I did like that. What, but, what, what's that guy's life? What's your, what's your pleasure? What's your pleasure? What's son? your pleasure? So somewhere, <laughs> you know, it's somewhere in Asia. Yes. Uh, it's an Asian man selling the box to another guy who's, you know heard about oh it. there's God, like a whole there's a whole storyline to be had yeah about somebody's traveling the world and <clears throat> excuse me yeah and hearing about this box but how do you hear about the box unless people have experienced the box exactly does that mean other people have come back um things like that so uh the last five minutes of the film <clears throat> excuse me yeah um where they just don't know what like how do you how does Christy? I just feel like all of that the the escaping of the falling house was unnecessary. Yes, she could have solved the box, kicked the Cenobites back across the schism to hell. Yeah, 
and then walked out of there and it was unnecessary. And then, of course, as she throws the box into the fire at the end, <laughs> the, this bum or the whatever bum, this bum is, who, I, I always thought that was Clive Barker. I looked it up this oh, morning. I always thought that was Clive Barker because he does have kind of a look yeah. like Clive Barker. And I had always assumed that was Clive Barker doing a cameo in his film. Mm. And I looked it up and, uh, and it wasn't it's him. Dumb. Yeah, yeah. But he catches I, fire. I just, yeah, to me, it's just, uh, the creature itself was dumb. Turns it was into, just, the, it's I weird. don't even know what the hell that was. I man. don't either. It was bad. And then what? The creature flies the box back to this guy, this Asian guy? Apparently, I mean, yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, I mean, I don't know, man. I, it's hard for me at times as I'm, like I said, as I'm approaching 50, it's like when I, when I watch this through a eyes of, I think I would have been 15 when this came out. And now I'm looking at it through a different lens. I just, I don't, I don't get past, I try not to get passes, man. Yeah. I just, and again, it's, it doesn't mean that Hellraiser is still not a good movie. It's still a good movie and it has great things happening here. I mean, hell, just alone, the practical effects and the music is, yeah. is really good. Like it, and the idea as a whole is great. It's just, you know, at times. And I do think that we need to shout out Bob Keen. I think I'm pretty sure that's his name. The the the, get, the the guy that did the special effects. Is that his name? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, no. Great, great. I mean, great. Look, I love practical effects. I will take practical effects over over like any sort of CGI <laughs> any day of the week. Any day of the week. Any day of the week. I know at times in movies it's just you can't do practical. That's so expensive and 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 now time and all these other things, but Dude, I would totally take it, man. And it's, you just don't see it as much anymore. Yeah. So when you see it, I'd love, like, like if I watch a movie these days and I see practical effects, I'm like, dude, I get so excited, yeah. man. And that's what makes a movie hold up over time. That's why you go back and watch The Lost Boys and the vampires still look so good in yeah. that movie. Yeah. Um, and I still think looking at Frank uh, in his reconstituting, the various reconstituting forms, uh, it he looks good because what you see is actually there. It exists yeah. in the world, and you can tell. Yes, if exactly. they redid it now, there would probably be some various, you know, CGI character of a skeleton, you know, walking across the the, the room. Now you look at if you watch Hellraiser and you look at that room and you look at the residue on the floor, yes. you look at the yeah. the sludge and the slime <laughs> and the and the different thing. You can smell that. You yes. know. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I agree, man. Whereas everything, when it's done digitally, it looks clean. It's, it, it is. It's just not right, man. No. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lost art, man. I mean, I, I understand it. I get it. I, I don't agree with it, but I get it. It's like whatever. But yeah. I feel like it's coming back, though. I feel like it I will hope, come back. I hope, man. I Look hope so. Everything, everything analog is going to find its way back. I think everything digital has is, is reached its peak, and people are starting to go back to practical effects. People are going back to, you know, pressing vinyl um yeah as opposed to streaming services all of that i feel like i feel in my heart like all of that stuff is connected i hope i hope you're right and we get another surge uh, like a resurgence of the video store we get a resurgence of the record store like i still believe there is a want and a need out there and i, I hope man i hope you're right i hope all of a sudden like some some new place pops up and it becomes a thing and you know yeah. and uh, honestly if it does come back i what i would be afraid of is that it it just becomes a fad for a particular generation and, yeah. and then it'll it'll and it just be goes away on again. again yeah you you're probably right on that man yeah. Well, anything? Did we did we miss anything? I mean, I'm sure we didn't probably hit everything, but I think we got the gist of the movie. I mean, I yeah. think, you know, we forgot to say spoilers earlier on, but I mean, I think, I think a lot of people know about Hellraiser. I mean, it was funny last night. I was I was having dinner with my um my neighbor and his he has two boys and they're I don't know their ages uh, they're younger and yeah. and they didn't know when I said Hellraiser they didn't know but they knew Pinhead. Yeah. It's, isn't it funny how it just you know definitely so so anyone who Again, apologize. We didn't say spoilers, but I mean, you know, um, I think if someone's listening to us, they know by now we're going to spoil the movie. And, and, you know, if you haven't seen it, you would you would have stopped us and and gone watch it and come back. But I agree. You know, if you haven't seen Hellraiser yet and you're into scary movies, a what's wrong with you? Yeah. If you haven't seen Hellraiser yet and you're not into scary movies, <laughs> don't watch it. 
Yeah, I would say. Just yeah, don't would, watch it. Yeah. Do I, yourself I, a favor and keep those images out of your head. Yes, I agree with that. Um, hey, man, before before we we wrap this up, first of all, I want to thank you again for coming out. Thanks uh, for having me. I had fun. Yeah, man, it's awesome. Um, and hopefully you come out again here soon. Uh, I think we you and I talked about maybe doing uh, Exorcist 3 here soon. Definitely. So, you know, so that will be another cool. great film. Yeah. Um, I love George C. Scott. Movie. Yes. Oh my God. He's such a great actor. Yes. Um, but, uh, uh, the band a plug, plug away, man. Oh. I know, I know, um, um, I know on Instagram, you guys are lesser sons band. Yeah. Lesser sons band. Um, and we are also on Spotify. Check us out. Lesser sons, uh, Apple music. Um, find us on Instagram. I think we have a Facebook page too. I think you do. Um, I think on Facebook, you're lesser sons T- tell, tell, uh, you know, tell the audience, uh, cause we're going to, what we're going to do is you're going to, you're going to, um, uh, we're going to have about a 30 to 40 second, um, you know, clip of, of, a, of one of your songs. Yeah. Tell, tell me about the song. Tell us about, uh, like, I mean, what would you guys classify yourself? Like, you know, like, you know, we're, I mean, we're a rock band, but we probably, uh, got a lot of our influence from like nineties punk. Um, okay. if you go back to like the fat records bands, um, but a lot of us have a lot of different influences and, um, I would say it's pretty much just generic rock and roll at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the song is called Hell uh, oh, for nice. the horror movie. Dude, that's uh, a totally appropriate. You go back to yeah. what we were talking about before. There is the line where, uh, you know, my my mom told me uh, the devil has you now. And yeah. I, I think that's pretty pretty much standard for anybody that's in a rock band that has a religious mother. She's probably said that <laughs> line to him in one way or another. Um, so uh, here's the uh, clip. And I hope you guys like it. Check yeah. us out. Lesser Sons uh, on Apple Music, Spotify. Yeah. Wherever, check it out. Cool, man. Thanks again, man. Thanks everyone, for having hey, me. Everyone, listen. All right, appreciate it. Thanks again for listening. Make sure you tell everyone about our Ear for Fear podcast. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Ear for Fear. You can also check out our website, earforfear.com. There you can keep up to date on news, events, and episodes. You can find us wherever you listen to podcasts. We hope you come back and get an earful.